10 Unsolved Mysteries of India, that you won't believe are true. The land of tantrics and black magic, India has enthralled generations and generations of scientists and researchers with mysteries that till today remain unsolved and unexplained. Let's take a look at some of these mysteries of India that have baffled people throughout the ages. 1. The mystery behind the hanging pillar of Lepukshi. The guide whipped out a twig from his shirt pocket with a flourish and said dramatically, Now I show you best part of Lepukshi temple. He got down on his knees before the large grey pillar before us. Bending forward, he passed the twig slowly under the pillar. From one end to the other, there was an audible gasp from the group of tourists, mostly Europeans, as the twig emerged from the other side. He repeated the exercise with a page of an old grimy newspaper, which he pulled out from another pocket. This was the famed hanging column or pillar of Lepakshi Temple, located in Anandapur district in southern Andhra Pradesh. This is the pillar which does not rest on the ground fully, the guide said, rising to stand beside us, and beaming triumphantly, almost as if he were the architect of this marvel. There are about 70 pillars at this fabulous 16th century, temple of stone in Vajayanagar style, but this one is the best known, and a tribute to the engineering genius of ancient and medieval India's temple builders. However, it is a bit dislodged from its original position, it is said that during the British era, a British engineer tried to move it in an unsuccessful attempt to uncover the secret of its support. Much of the temple is built on a low, rocky hill called Kermasalam, which translates to Tortoise Hill in Telugu, after the shape of the hill. The temple dates back to 1583, and was built by the brothers, Virupana and Virna, who were initially in the service of the Vijayanagar kings. However, Puranic lore has it that the Virabhadra temple was built by the sage Agastya. It has idols of Gainsha, Nandi, Virabhadra, Shiva, Badrakli, Vishnu and Lakshmi. Another legend gives the town a significant place in the Ramayana, this was where the bird Jatayu fell, wounded after a futile battle against Ravana, who was carrying away Sita. When Sri Rama reached the spot, he saw the bird and said compassionately, Lopakshi, rise, bird in Telugu. Besides the hanging pillar, another draw is the spectacular Nandi, located almost a mile before the main temple, the first structure you will encounter. At 27 feet in length and 15 feet in height, it is a colossal structure, reputedly India's biggest monolithic Nandi. Besides the record size, the perfectly proportioned body, finely carved ornaments, and smooth contours add to its grandeur, and make it a popular photo op with visitors. Once you reach the temple's outer enclosure, you will see a mammoth Gainsha, hewn in stone and leaning against a rock. Perpendicular to it is a massive noggle with three coils and seven hoods. It forms a sheltering canopy over a black granite shivalingam. It's reckoned by many as the largest Naglinga in India. There are two red blotches on the western wall of the inner enclosure, explained by a gory story. Virupana, the royal treasurer was accused of drawing funds without the king's permission from the state treasury to build these shrines. However, he forestalled the enraged king's punishment by blinding himself, and those maroon spots are said to be the marks left by his bleeding eyes. The temple's main deity is Virabhadra, the fiery god created by Shiva in his rage, after the Dakshayagna and the immolation of Parvati. There are several forms of Shiva here, a majestic Kankal Amarthi, Dakshanamarthi, Guru of Gurus, Tripur Nthaka or Tripur Jura Samhara, Vanquisher of Demon Tripura, Ardhanarishwara, the half-female, half-male form, where Shiva and Parvati are equally represented in one body, etc. Another shrine has the fiery goddess Badrakli, though bearing an uncharacteristically serene expression. The Lepakshi temple also has the finest specimens, of mural paintings of the Vijayanagara kings. We were informed that the 24 by 14 feet fresco of the Rabhadra on the ceiling, before the main sanctum sanctorum is the largest in India of any single figure. The rest of the frescoes are also beautiful, and show an impressive attention to detail with colors strikingly contrasted, black lime work against an orange-red background with some green, white, black, and shades of ochre gold and brown mostly applied to a stucco surface specially treated with lime. The Shiva Parvathi Kalyanam an enduringly popular subject with traditional Indian artists, finds expression here. However, these frescoes are peeling off in many places, 
and in need of better maintenance and expert restoration. After the ache in the neck from gazing upwards at these alluring frescoes, we sat down for a while, rubbing our necks, in the splendid Nate Amandapam or dance hall with its superbly sculpted pillars. The Kalyan Amandapam is another hall known for its artistic beauty. Among the many eye-catchers in this temple, the frieze of geese with lotus stalks in their beaks stands out. The Lepakshi temple is close to the famed pilgrim town of Puttaparthi, where the nearest decent accommodation is available, whether in the ashram or in the Andhra Pradesh government run Sai Arimam. From here, it is an hour's drive to the temple. From Hyderabad it is about 480 km and about 130 km from Bangalore. The climate is hot for most of the year, and early mornings are the best time to visit. If you have time, check out nearby Dharmavaram, the well-known silk weaving center, and Hinjapur and surrounding villages where, elegant cottons are woven. 2. The Mystery of the Nine Unknown Men There is a pervasive legend in India of a secret organization, that allegedly has a vast amount of advanced knowledge in their possession. Believed to have been formed over 2,000 years ago, the Nine Unknown Men is widely suspected of manipulating political, and societal trends in order to further the personal goals of the Nine. But is such a secret organization a reality or is it merely the stuff of legend? The Society of the Nine Unknown Men was formed shortly, after 226 BC by Emperor Ashoka. Grandson of the legendary emperor, who unified the Indian subcontinent, Chandragupta, Ashoka was anxious to uphold his grandfather's legacy and maintain the empire. In the region between Calcutta and Madras, the Kalingans resisted the imperial rule, leading to an all-out war. Ashoka's vastly superior forces are said to have killed over 100,000 of Kalinga's warriors, and deported over 150,000 of the region's villagers. Even though he had won the war, Ashoka was aghast at the carnage such a victory entailed. From then on, he swore off violence forever. Emperor Ashoka is best known for his conversion to Buddhism, and his efforts to spread the peaceful religion throughout India as well as Malaya, Ceylon, and Indonesia. His efforts contributed to Buddhism's later rise in China, Nepal, Tibet, and Mongolia. Ashoka was a sworn vegetarian but did not force others to do likewise. Indeed, he was incredibly tolerant of other religious sects. He did, however, prohibit the consumption of alcohol. Most importantly, he renounced the idea of trying to integrate the rebellious people, declaring that the only true conquest was to win men's hearts by observance of the laws of duty and piety, because the sacred majesty desired that all living creatures should enjoy security, peace and happiness and be free to live as they pleased, Powells and Bergier. So committed was the emperor to this mission, that he sought to prevent his fellow man, from putting their intelligence towards perpetrating evil, particular the evil involved with warfare. The task of collecting, preserving, and containing all knowledge was too great for one emperor to do alone not the least because of the other duties required by ruling an empire. So Ashoka summoned nine of the most brilliant minds in India at the time. For security purposes, the identity of these men was never made public. Together, these geniuses formed a secret society that came to be known as the Nine Unknown Men. The organization set up accumulating all of the scientific knowledge they could, from natural science to psychology to the composition of matter. Fearing that if ordinary men were given scientific knowledge they would use it for destruction, only the nine men were allowed to study, and develop scientific theories and technology. To better accomplish this daunting task, each of the nine was charged with a specific book that he was to update, revise, and ultimately perfect the knowledge therein. When one of the nine could no longer complete the task, whether from the wish to retire, fading health, or death, the obligation was passed to a chosen successor. The number of members in the society was always to be nine. Thus the society of the nine unknown men has allegedly lived on for over 2,000 years. Speculation about the contents of each of the nine books varies widely. Talbot Mundy, an English writer, published a book entitled The Nine Unknown Men in 1923, which contained a list of the nine books. This list has come to be generally accepted. 1. Propaganda, the first book dealt with techniques of propaganda, and psychological warfare. The most dangerous of all sciences is that of molding mass opinion, because it would enable anyone to govern the whole world, according to Mundy. 2. Physiology, 
The second book discussed physiology, and explains how to kill a person simply by touching him or her, known as the the touch of death, simply by the reversal of a nerve impulse. It is said that the martial art of judo is a result of leakages from the second book. 3. Microbiology The third volume focused on microbiology and biotechnology. 4. Alchemy The fourth dealt with alchemy, and transmutation of metals. According to another legend, in times of severe drought, temples and religious relief organizations received large quantities of gold from a secret source. 5. Communication The fifth book contained a study of all means of communication, terrestrial and extraterrestrial, alluding then that the nine unknown men were aware of alien presence. 6. Gravity The sixth book focused on the secrets of gravitation, and actual instructions on how to make the ancient Vedic Vimana, like Vaimanika Shastra on aerospace technology. 7. Cosmogony The seventh contained cosmogony and matters of the universe. 8. Light The eighth dealt with light including the speed, and how to use it as a weapon. 9. Sociology The ninth and final book discussed sociology. It included rules for the evolution of societies, and the means of foretelling their decline. Mundi paraphrased by ancient explorers. Fact or myth? But were the nine unknown men real? Ashok may very well have asked nine men of unknown identity, to gather scientific knowledge, particularly with regards to its application to warfare. This was a very fractious time and other emperors have been known to order similar initiatives. These men may have explored different empires battle tactics and training, weapons manufacturing, horse, elephant handling, and maybe even gunpowder usage. However, an ancient group living on in secrecy for over 2,000 years, controlling global events from the remote jungles of India with not a hint of modern equipment, infrastructure, or technology is hard to believe. For many, the legend is most likely just a legend. 3. The Mystery of the Skeletons in Rupkund Lake Imagine a frozen lake which, upon melting each year, reveals the unnerving sight of the remains of more than 300 people. A small lake known as Rupkund Lake sits high in the Indian Himalayas, more than 16,000 feet 4, meters, above sea level. Covered in ice and surrounded by rocky glaciers, the lake appears to be a typical, albeit beautiful, natural wonder. However, during one month of the year, when the ice melts away, and the bottom of the shallow lake becomes visible, the true nature of the lake reveals itself. At the bottom of the lake are hundreds of mysterious human skeletons. There have been efforts to determine who these people were, where they were from, and how they died, but many questions still remain unanswered about the skeletons at Rupkund, now referred to as Skeleton Lake. Rupkund Lake is located at the bottom of a small valley in the Himalayas, in Chamali district, Uttaranchal in India. The lake is very shallow, with its greatest depth at approximately 2 meters. The area is a popular destination for adventurous tourists, due to the spectacular trek to get there. There are several trekking routes on the way to Rupkund, which many take advantage of, both for the picturesque view, and to satisfy the curiosity and intrigue surrounding the skeletal remains. The first reports regarding the skeletal remains date to the 19th century, but the remains were rediscovered by Nandadavi Game Reserve Ranger H.K. Matwell in 1942. He discovered a few of the skeletons, at the bottom of the lake while it was frozen. As summer came, and the frozen lake melted, more skeletons were revealed in the lake, and around the lake's edges. It is believed that the skeletons number around 300. When the discovery was made, there was no information available about the remains. No one knew who the remains belonged to, how long they had been there, or what had happened to them. Since the skeletons had been rediscovered during World War II, the first assumption was that these were the skeletons of soldiers, perhaps Japanese soldiers who had died from exposure to the elements, while traveling through India. Because of this possibility, determining the source of the remains became a priority. A team of investigators was sent to Rootkund, where they quickly determined that the remains were too old to be from the ongoing war. With the immediate concerns of war being eased, the urgency of identifying the remains became less of a priority and efforts to further analyze the remains were sidelined. With later investigation, it became apparent that the remains consisted of more than just bones. The frigid temperatures, and dry, cold air allowed bits of flesh, nails, and hair to be preserved as well. 
In addition, pieces such as wooden artifacts, iron spearheads, leather slippers, and jewelry were discovered. Oxford University's Radiocarbon Accelerator Unit conducted radiocarbon dating on the remains, and concluded that they date back to around 850 AD. Without any evidence of a nearby settlement, it is believed that the individuals were traveling when they died. But what caused their death? Was there a massive landslide? Did some disease strike suddenly? Were the individuals conducting a ritualistic suicide? Did they die of starvation? Were they killed in an enemy attack? One theory even suggests that the individuals did not die at the scene of the lake, but their bodies were deposited there as a result of glacial movement. There is one local legend that may shed some light on the identity of the remains. According to legend, Raja Jasdevil, the king of Kanwaj, was traveling with his pregnant wife, Rani Balamba. They were accompanied by servants, a dance troupe, and others as they traveled on a pilgrimage to Nanda Devi Shrine, for the Nanda Devi Rajjat, which takes place every 12 years. As they traveled, they were overcome by a sudden, severe hailstorm with extremely large hailstones. The storm was too strong, and with nowhere to take shelter, the entire group perished near Rup Kund. For a long time this story appeared to be a legend, with no evidence to substantiate it. However, recent finds may lend some support to the legend. In 2013, researchers concluded that it likely, that the individuals had been killed in a hailstorm. The injuries on the remains indicate, that each person was killed by one or more blows to the head, neck, and shoulders. There do not appear to be injuries on any other parts of their bodies, which rules out death by landslide, avalanche, or weapons. As of today, the conclusion that this group of people died due to a severe hailstorm remains the most plausible explanation as to what happened to them on their ill-fated journey. However, there has been no verification as to whether this was a group traveling with the King of Kanwaj, as legend states. Today, there are concerns about the conservation of Rube Kund. Many trekkers have traveled there to see the remains. Many people travel there by mule, and take bones and skeletons with them as they leave. The large numbers of visitors, and the mule striking through the area bring concerns of damage to the remains that are there. Of course, of greater concern, is the removal of remains. While some information has been determined about the individuals, there may be a great more data to uncover, but this possibility gets smaller as more and more remains are destroyed and removed. Efforts have been made to protect that area as an eco-tourist destination, so people can still view the wonders of Rup Kund, without risking destruction or removal of the skeletons. Preserving the possibility of further research is essential, if there is going to be hope of learning more about the mysterious group of people, that were killed over a millennia ago in the Himalayas. 4. The Mystery of the Yeti The first accounts of Yetis emerged before the 19th century from Buddhists, who believed that the creature inhabited the Himalayas. They depicted the mysterious beast as having similarities to an ape, and carrying a large stone as a weapon while making a whistling sound. The term abominable snowman was developed in 1921, following a book by Lt. Col. Charles Howard Berry, called Mount Everest the Reconnaissance. Popular interest in creature gathered pace in early 20th century as tourists, began making their own trips to the region to try and capture the Yeti. They reported seeing strange markings in the snow. The Daily Mail in a trip called that the Snowman Expedition in 1954 to Everest. During the trip mountaineering leader John Angelo Jackson photographed ancient, paintings of Yetas and large footprints in the snow. A number of hair samples were also found, that were believed to have come from a Yeti scalp. British mountaineer Don Willans claimed to have witnessed a creature, when scaling Annapurna in 1970. He said that while searching for a campsite he heard some odd cries, which his guide attributed to a Yeti's call. That night, he saw a dark shape moving near his camp. They had eluded explorers, hunters and scientists, who have been searching the Himalayan mountains for the mysterious Yeti for over a century. Now it seems we are no closer to knowing, what creature lies behind the mysterious sightings, and footprints that have led to the legend of the abominable snowman. A key piece of evidence that suggested many of the sightings were due, to an unknown type of bear living in the Himalaya has now been ruled out. Biologists used DNA analysis to examine claims, that hair samples attributed to Yetas appear to belong to a scientifically undiscovered species of bear. Instead they have found that the DNA in the hair samples has degraded making it, 
impossible to attribute them to any species of bear. The researchers conclude, however, that from the color and shape of the hair samples, they were likely to have come from common Himalayan brown bears rather than an unknown species of bear. This means that the identity of the species behind Yeti sightings is still a mystery. Dr. Elisa Gutierrez, an evolutionary biologist at the Smithsonian Institution, said one of the hair samples had apparently come from a bear that had been shot by hunters. He said, we have concluded that there is no reason to believe that the two samples came from anything other than brown bears. What strikes us as odd is that an experienced hunter, who was very familiar with the brown bear, could mistake the animal that he had shot for anything other than a bear of some sort and, specifically, for a yeti. Corroboration and documentation of, as well as other information concerning, the anecdote of this bear being shot by the hunter, and the subsequent history of the hair that was saved would be most welcome. In 2014 Professor Brian Sykes, a geneticist at the University of Oxford, found that DNA extracted two samples of yeti hair, from the Himalaya were a 100% match, with a 40,000-year-old fossil polar bear, but not to modern species of polar bear. However, subsequent analysis by researchers from the University of Copenhagen found that the hair was not from a polar bear. Professor Sykes and his colleagues maintained, however, that the hair samples must be from an otherwise unknown species of bear living in the Himalaya. Now Dr. Gutierrez and Dr. Ronald Pine, a zoologist at the University of Kansas, have found that the DNA from the samples cannot be assigned to any species of bear. Writing in the journal Zookeys, they said, the molecular data obtained and analyzed by Sykes are not informative enough to suggest the possibility that a taxonomically unrecognized type of bear exists in the Himalayas. We emphasize that no evidence has ever been presented to suggest that an unknown bear species occurs in the Himalayas. As part of their study, Dr. Gutierrez and Dr. Pine examined how gene sequences can reveal the relationships between the six present-day species of bears. They found one sequence from an Asian black bear from Japan indicated that it was not closely related to the mainland members of that species. Professor Sykes insisted that the findings from the new study did not invalidate his own findings. He said, what mattered most to our project was that these two hairs were definitely not from unknown primates. The explanation by Guterres and Pine might be right, or it might not be. The only way forward, as I have repeatedly said, is to find a living bear that matches the 12 sRNA, and and study fresh material from it. Which involves getting off your butt, not an activity I usually associate with desk-bound molecular taxonomists. 5. The Mysterious Village of Twins At first glance one might not notice anything particularly odd about the village of Kodini. It is a small, remote village located in the Malapuram district in Kerala, India. With only 2,000 families, it is a sleepy, quiet place that one could drive by without giving a second thought. It is a backwater, nondescript village not unlike countless others dotting the Indian countryside. However, spend enough time walking through its modest streets, you may start to notice something peculiar about this village. You may start having a case of seeing double, for there are twins everywhere, of all ages, both identical and fraternal. In fact, there almost seems to be a pair of twins, for practically every family in the village. Kodini has the distinction of having the most unusually high rate of twin births in the world. In a village of only 2,000 people, there are reportedly over 220 pairs of twins. It was reported that in 2008 alone, 15 pairs of twins were born in the village. This may not seem like a high number when talking about a big city, but it is bizarrely high for such a small, relatively sparsely populated town. To put it into perspective, it is said that the rate of twin births globally is around 6 out of every 1,000 live births, whereas in Kodini it is more like 42 out of every 1,000 births, a striking contrast to the norm. In fact, the rate of twins in this sleepy, tropical town is around six times the global average. Local Dr. Krishnan Srubiju has spent a great deal of time studying the twins of Kodini and he believes that the rate of twin births is even higher than official records suggest. He also has found that the rate of twin births in the village is increasing every year, and that the number of twins in Kodini has doubled in the past decade. 
Dr. Srabiju is also quick to point out that the phenomenal rate of twin births in the village is particularly impressive considering that subcontinental Asia has a typically lower rate of twin births than most of the world, and India has the lowest twinning rate in Asia. Indeed, generally India has one of the lowest twinning rates in the world, making Kodani even more of a curiosity. It is said that the twinning phenomenon in Kodani started around 60 to 70 years ago, and the exact cause remains unknown. Doctors have long been baffled as to why this village has so many twins, and no one as of yet has been able to unravel the mystery. Adding another layer of odd to the puzzle is the fact, that even those who marry outsiders and move away from the village, exhibit a substantially higher than normal rate of having twins. Researchers have delved into genetic, biological, molecular, hereditary and climatic factors and still have not, come to a satisfactory conclusion to this enigma. Pollutants or chemical factors have been mostly ruled out since the vast majority, of twins born in Kodini are perfectly normal and healthy, without birth defects. In addition, artificial insemination or other fertility treatments are not a factor, as the villagers are too poor to afford the prohibitively high costs of such procedures. Genetic problems have also mostly been discounted, since the effect is localized in this one village. Dr. Subiju speculates that the answer lies in something, the villagers are eating or drinking, but none has been able to isolate the substance that could be responsible. Further compounding this theory is that the eating habits of the villagers, of Kodini don't seem to be any different than other villages in Kerala. Dr. Srubiju has said he plans to continue research in Kodini, with more detailed biochemical analysis equipment, but for now the abnormal number of twins here remains an unexplained anomaly. Fortunately for the villagers here, the twinning phenomenon has had no real negative effects except for perhaps people not being able to always quickly ascertain just which twin they are talking to. School teachers here like to joke that they are never sure, if a student is really the one attending the class, or their twin. Mistaken identity is probably a real headache here, yet for the most part there have been no health concerns, and the village even seems to be proud of their unique status. In order to bring wider attention to the peculiar problems twins here face, Around 30 pairs of twins in the village started an organization called, the Twins and Keens Association. It is reportedly the first such association of its kind in India, and it is hoped that the group will be able to raise awareness of Kodini's plight, and the unique lifestyles of twins. Just what is going on in the remote village of Kodini? What is the reason they have so many twins? For now, no one really knows. If you ever find yourself in this village, and start seeing double yourself, just remember that it is not just your imagination playing tricks on you. 6. The Mystery of Jog Burboom Imagine how you would feel if on one fine morning, just hours after you started your daily routine of your not-so-peaceful life, you hear a deafening sound out of nowhere. You might immediately start thinking of it as a massive explosion somewhere. What if you or anyone else fails to figure out what caused the sound? Exactly that is what the people of Jodhpur felt. On a fine morning of December 18, 2012, precisely at 11.25 am, people of Jodhpur, India were startled by a deafening sound, that appeared out of nowhere in the sky. The sound resembled the sound caused by a jet plane crossing the speed of sound. This phenomenon is known as sonnet boom, but the problem with Jodhpur boom was that the sound was far more profound and deafening. While the sound sounded like a massive explosion, what really added to the panic wave that struck the people, of Jodhpur was the thought of Earth coming to an end, as per the Mayan calendar which predicted, that Earth will be destroyed in 2012. Rumors quickly spread that the sound was an outcome of a sonic boom, caused by a new breed of aircraft tested by the Air Force or perhaps, it was caused by an explosion in the ammunition storehouse of the nearby Army area. Army personnel however declined the possibility of ammunition explosion, Kalas D. Goswami, defense spokesperson openly said, that the sound was not an outcome of any explosion. He went on saying that sonic boom caused by testing aircrafts was also not a possibility, because sonic boom is completely forbidden in township areas. He explained that, when an object travels through air at a speed greater than that of sound, an enormous amount of sound energy is released, which sounds very much like an explosion, but since sonic booms in township areas are capable of inflicting enormous property damage, such as crumbling of window panes, 
sonic booms are always tested at least 60 kilometers outside the town areas where there is no population. While no explanation has been found for this sudden deafening Jodhpur boom, that appeared out of nowhere crashing in the sky, it was not a singular incident. These sounds or booms were actually taking place, all over the world including USA and UK. Geologists reported that the seismic readings, during the booms were unlike anything ever recorded before. What caused these booms? This question isn't going to be answered anytime soon, and we can only hope that someday we get to know the cause and source. 7. The Great Taj Mahal Conspiracy It is no secret that the Taj Mahal is a monument of love, built by a Mughal emperor as the final resting place for his beloved queen, who died giving birth to their 14th child in 1631. What's less known is that the white marble tomb was not her first resting place after death. Queen Mumtaz Mahal in fact died some 900 kilometers away in central India's Burhanpur town, and was buried there, in a rose-tinted sandstone pavilion in her favorite deer park. The once opulent and richly decorated pavilion is now a sad, crumbling a ruin, thanks to neglect and apathy by authorities, and Burhanpur's own 200,000 residents. And it's not the only gem in the treasure chest of this town, which even most Indians could not identify on a map. Behind its sturdy, unpaved streets and open garbage dumps, Burhanpur hides an abundance of magnificent Islamic monuments dating back to 15th century. Once an important trading and military outpost, Burhanpur slipped into margins of history in less than two centuries, and is now nowhere to be found in any tourist advertisement. On a recent trip, we found in Burhanpur the ruins of a riverside palace, airy pavilions with intricately carved pillars, grand stone mausoleums with latticed windows, that throw filtered beams of dusty light on the graves inside, a royal bathhouse with cheerful paintings of birds and flowers, austere and imposing mosques with incredibly fine calligraphy, and a fort on a cliff with a mind-boggling view of the undulating plains below. Each one of the town's treasures is a reminder of India's rich multicultural history, and the contribution that about 800 years of Muslim rule, made to the predominantly Hindu country's heritage. Many of the monuments in the town are in utter neglect. Infrastructure as basic as toilets and roads to the sites is missing. Open drains run along some important tombs, which are ravaged by overgrown shrubs. Mountains of garbage greet visitors. Every monument here tells a story. Every stone here says come to me, and listen to what I have to say, but there is nobody to listen or to take care of them," lamented Hoshang Havlader, 60, who has lived all his life in Burhanpur, and runs one of only two decent hotels in the town. Burhanpur was ruled by the founding Faruqi dynasty from 1400 to 1599, and by the fabled Mughals from 1600, when Emperor Akbar conquered it. His grandson, Emperor Shah Jahan, ran his military campaigns against southern kingdoms from Burhanpur, accompanied by his wife Mumtaz. She died while giving birth to their 14th child, and was buried in a pavilion facing a small palace in a deer park. Today, the Ahikana, as the park was called, and its two buildings are one of the most dilapidated among Burhanpur's treasures. The sprawling park is locked up with no caretaker. Its rusty metal gates are tied by a chain loose enough to leave enough space for humans or animals to slip through. The grounds are overgrown with shrubs and weeds. Wild goats and cows roam freely. All that remain of the one-story pavilion are pillars and walls, some artwork on them still visible. Its ceiling is no more. For about six months, Mumtaz's body remained in the pavilion, while Shah Jahan made plans to build the Taj Mahal on the banks of the nearby river Tapti. But unfortunately Burhampur's geography, geology and hydrology conspired against his plans. According to historians, Shah Jahan wanted the monument to be of white marble, which was only available in the faraway Markana, making transportation difficult. River Tapti's breadth was a little narrow where he envisaged the mausoleum, meaning it would not be reflected fully in the water on moonlit nights. Finally, the rock bed just wasn't right to hold up a building of that mass. As it turned out, Agra on the banks of majestically wide river Yamuna, and not too far from Markana, was the perfect choice. Mumtaz's body was disinterred and taken to Agra, then the imperial capital of the Mughal Empire, that ruled India from 15th to 19th centuries. And so Burhampur faded away.
One of the most beautiful monuments in Burhampur is the tomb of Bilkwas Jahan, the wife of Shah Jahan's son. It is known as the Karbuzi Gumbaz, or Melon Dome, because of its distinctive dome, and bulging walls that look like the fruit. An unimposing structure, it nevertheless stands out because of its shape and stunning interior, every corner of its walls and roof is decorated with murals in floral pattern, its colors as fresh as they were centuries ago. But to get there we had to walk through a graveyard, where a horse lay dying in a ditch while little boys played nearby. 8. The Story of Bullet Baba If you are traveling through the Pali Jodhpur Highway in Rajasthan, without worshipping the Bullet Baba, beware, there is no surety that you would reach your destination. The vehicle riding through here passes without stopping by blowing the horn and that is the offering for Baba. I heard about a temple for actress Gushbu in Tamil Nadu. It invoked my fancy when I heard about a temple for bullet lovers. The journey to Jodhpur was in bullet. So there is no chance to move without worshipping the bullet temple. After moving 20 kilometers from Pali, on the wayside stood a dwarf tree, which attained black color due to continuous exposure to fire and smoke. Not a single leaf was in green color. But still the tree stood blossomed. But the flowers were different colors of bangles, and handkerchief offered by the devotees in the form of their various prayers and wishes. They believed that Bullet Baba would fulfill all their wishes. Om Bana that is the name of this roadside village. The village also attained the name from Bullet Baba. The people here started to worship the bullet from not so long. The reincarnation story of Baba is not so old, too. The incident occurred in 1991. Om Singh was the son of Jog Singh, who was the head of Chadula village which is only 3 km away from Bana village. When the youth belonged to Rajaputra clan used to suffix Bana to their names, Om Singh was known in the name Om Bana. Om Bana bought bullet immediately after his marriage. His love towards his bullet was very unusual. Bana while riding his bullet from Chadala to Pali, met with an accident as his bullet hit a tree and he fell into a pit and died. The next day police recovered his body, from a 20 feet deep pit. Police took the bike to police station. According to Faithful, the bike, which was in the police station, was mysteriously found at the accident site. Thinking that somebody might have done consciously, police again brought it back to the station and emptied the petrol tank. But on that night to the incident repeated. Out of fear, the policeman handed over the bike to Bana's relatives. They sold the same to a person from Gujarat. But mysteriously the bike returned to the accident spot covering 400 kilometers distance. The person who bought it also abandoned it. As such instances kept on recurring, a temple was founded here. The stories go on like this. Another one is that, during the night of Bana's death, the soul of Om Bana asked to lift to a driver of the truck, which was passing through the road. While it reached the accident spot, Bana asked the driver to blow the horn. For whatever purpose you are moving ahead, that would be fulfilled, Bana said and disappeared. The devotees say that they hear the roar of his bullet in the midnight, from the day on which he died. They also believe that his soul might be with the bike still now. The rituals began in the temple four years back. Now the temple has a priest too. While hearing the word temple, don't assume it as big building. A basement had been built attaching the tree in which the bullet was hit. There kept a photo of Ambana and an idol made of marble. The pujas are being performed here. The devotees performed the libation of beer in this idol. Behind that the bullet was kept under a roofed place. The devotees said during a shitmi day, the bullet starts itself. A part of the petrol tank has been worn out. The people living surrounding the village have great belief over Baba. During wedding, the newlyweds come and worship here. The members of Rajputra families bring their newborn here. They see Bana as their inherited god. They perform the ritual of removing their baby's hair here only. As the consumption of liquor is recognized among the Rajputras, the beer is offered here. Surrounding the temple are shops seen like in temple festivals. All the puja materials can be bought here in liquor too, but only as offerings to Baba. The unending clamor of horns would pierce your ears, and adding to that was the devotional songs played through the cone speaker. After worshipping the bullet Baba and going towards Jodhpur I thought, here is a god, in the form of a vehicle. 9. Pradyani. Pradyani is being held in isolation in a hospital in Ahmedabad, Gurjarat, where he is being closely monitored by India's Defense Research Organization, 
who believed he may have a genuine quality which could help save lives. He has now spent six days without food, or water under strict observation, and doctors say his body has not yet shown any adverse effects, from hunger or dehydration. Mr. Yanni, who claims to have left home age seven, and lived as a wandering sadhu or holy man in Rajasthan, is regarded as a brethren who can live on a spiritual life force alone. He believes he is sustained by a goddess, who pours an elixir through a hole in his palate. His claims have been supported by an Indian doctor, who specializes in studies of people, who claim supernatural abilities, but he has also been dismissed by others as a village fraud. India's Defense Research Development Organization, whose scientists develop drone aircraft, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and new types of bombs. They believe Mr. Prelud could teach them, to help soldiers survive longer without food, or disaster victims to hang on until help arrives. If his claims are verified, it will be a breakthrough in medical science, said Dr. G. I. L. Avazhagan, director of the Defense Institute of Physiology and Allied Sciences. We will be able to help save human lives during natural disasters, high altitude, sea journeys and other natural and human extremities. We can educate people about the survival techniques in adverse conditions, with little food and water or nothing at all. So far, Mr. Prout appears to be standing up to scrutiny. He has not eaten or drunk any fluids in six days, and similarly has not passed urine or a stool in that time. He remains fit and healthy and shows no sign of lethargy. Doctors will continue observing him for 15 days in which time, they would expect to see some muscle wastage, serious dehydration, weight loss, and fatigue followed by organ failure. It is common in India for Jains and Hindus to fast, sometimes for up to eight days, without any adverse effects, as part of their religious worship. Most humans cannot survive without food for 50 days. The longest hunger strike recorded is 74 days. According to Dr. Sudhir Shah, who examined him in 2003, he went without food or water for 10 days in which urine appeared, to be reabsorbed by his body after forming in his bladder. Doubts were expressed about his claim, after his weight fell slightly at the end of the trial. 10. The Mysterious Bird Suicide Phenomenon of Jadinga Jadinga is a small village located in Assam, a state in northeastern India. The village is lush green and scenic, surrounded by serene mountains. But that's not what it's famous for. In fact, Jadinga is well known for an entirely different reason, its bird mystery. The bird mystery is a unique phenomenon that occurs at Jadinga between September and November each year. During these late monsoon months, several migratory and local birds commit mass suicide at the village. Just after sunset, between 7 and 10 p.m., hundreds of birds descend from the sky, plummeting to their deaths by crashing into buildings and trees. Since birds aren't known to be suicidal, the phenomenon has baffled villagers, visitors and scientists alike. For many years, locals believed that evil spirits living in the skies were responsible for bringing down the birds. Of course, this isn't true. After several scientific studies and experiments, it has been concluded that the birds are generally disoriented by the monsoon fog. So they are attracted by the village lights and fly towards them, sometimes hitting walls and trees during the descent. Some of the birds die, while others are grievously injured, becoming easy prey for the villagers to capture. These birds are often dazed and disheveled, and do not put up any resistance, when villagers attack them with catapults or bamboo sticks. Studies also show that the birds come in only from the north, and land only on a well-defined strip in the village, that's 1.5 kilometers long and 200 meters wide. Lights placed along the southern side of the village have failed to attract any birds. The victim birds aren't long-distance migrators. 44 species have been identified as suicidal and most of them come from nearby valleys and hill slopes. These include kingfishers, black bitterns, tiger bitterns and pond herons, among others. A few more interesting discoveries were made by scientists and bird watchers. It seems most of the suicidal birds lose their national habitats due to flooding during the monsoon season. So they appear to be migrating to other places, and Jadinga is in their migratory path. But it isn't clear why the birds fly at night, or why they get voluntarily trapped at the same place every year. It is not suicide, to be precise, said Anwar Adan Chowdhury, a well-known ornithologist in Assam. 
but the fact remains that birds are attracted by light, and fly towards any object with a light source. This phenomenon still puzzles bird specialists. India's most celebrated ornithologist, the late Salim Ali, was also baffled. The most puzzling thing to me about this phenomenon is that, so many species of diurnal resident birds should be on the move when, by definition, they should be fast asleep. The problem deserves a deeper scientific study from various angles, he wrote. The phenomenon of avian harakiri, as the locals call it, was first observed by the Zimnagas, the inhabitant tribe of the region in the early 1900s. It frightened them so badly that they sold their land to Jainches and left the place in 1905. The new inhabitants also observed the phenomenon, but interpreted it as a gift from God. The Jainches aren't entirely wrong. After all, the phenomenon has captured the interest of wildlife circles and tourists, making the village of Jading a world famous. The birds alone are responsible for a boost in tourism during the monsoon months. And they're quite delicious, locals relish these exotic delicacies. The villagers deliberately switch on lights, and lanterns to attract the birds and capture them every year. To promote tourism, district authorities have created a festival around the bird suicide, called the Jadinga Festival. The first edition was held in 2010. If you're interested in viewing the rare phenomenon in person, the nearest airport at the city of Guwahati is 350 kilometers away from the village. You will have to wait until next year, though.